Hello and welcome back to another video. Today is sort of an analysis, sort of not. Today we are arriving with the premature question of what are the positive takeaways from Carlton's season so far? And I know we've got the totally massive sample of eight quarters to go off, but still there are some takeaways to gather. So let's delve into what those are. If you did miss part one of the analysis for this match specifically, the round one match, make sure to go to the top right hand corner of the video right now or check the description for that video. If you're a regular viewer and want to support the channel financially because you enjoy what I do, make sure to click the join button below. You can become a channel member for a small fee every 30 days. Make sure to like the video if you go on to enjoy this one and also make sure to subscribe if you're new so you can stay tuned as to when the next analysis video goes live next week. Enjoy! First up, it is a different profile of scoring that we've been subjected to so far and with that is a different style of play. We delved into this more so in the previous video and the video before that, but to quantify in an efficient fashion, 17 of the last 18 premiers have ranked in the top three in turnover game. Grand finalist Brisbane were number one in 2023. Carlton, the number one team for points off clearance. Although against Brisbane, Carlton absolutely smoked the Lions in their third quarter surge from points off turnover, absolutely dominating possession and forcing error with regularity, and then had an incredibly lopsided output of scoring against Richmond that favoured their turnover game over their stoppage game. Why would this be? It started with the 50-50 battles that I felt Richmond in round one really took charge of mostly. Here's one stoppage goal for the Tigers. You'll see whilst the Blues get the hands to it, they never enforce another ball up or even get a clean disposal away. That is Richmond's strength right here. You'll notice that although not intentional, Tom Lynch has actually impeded Hewitt marginally as Lynch tries to cut away from the contest into space. And that little obstacle that Hewitt has to navigate around gives Dow the extra second to avoid Hewitt from grabbing him front on. Rather, Hewitt has to grab him side on and Dow's momentum allows the arms to actually remain free, which means he can get the hands away and the Tigers can score the goal. Those battles that felt like Richmond won more regularly. Now, one of the reasons for Carlton's turnover game to thrive so far this season would happen to do with Carlton's absurd pressure on the ball. How many times will you hear Michael Voss say pressure and contest? How many times will you hear the leaders of the football club say pressure and contest? Carlton had a stupid pressure rating with a killer tackle count against Richmond, especially in the first half of that game. And Carlton in the second quarter of that game had 21 midfield intercepts, which led to 16 inside 50s and basically the entirety of their second quarter score. The first quarter where their defensive half transition held them in good stead, not their territory game, only three forward half intercepts. Here's some examples of a Richmond system and their stoppage game being counteracted with Carlton's turnover game. Here, Richmond get the clearance, but their own poor disposal and then the Blues' ability to apply pressure, capitalize on that dispossession and bring the ball forward has been a staple of their first two matchups and has allowed the Blues to notably be very damaging in transition. They utilize the forward hand pass well, probably a few lapses of judgment here though. For example, no deconing Shepard to buy Kennedy more time maybe an extra hand pass to gain a little bit more distance on the opponent would have helped carry the ball further. But the result is favorable regardless. A good kick into space, but the bounce is definitely to the detriment of the Blues. Probably this is the exact time you want to look for Charlie, this sort of dynamic with this much space. But this is where Carlton have cooked, especially when you watch this game of footy early on. Here you can see another example of the two systems butting heads. The Nankervis Hopper combination is effective, and then the Blues have a well-set defensive mechanism. Numbers pushing into the space behind the stoppage, meaning even with Dusty winning it, there is nothing ahead and they have to run and carry. Run and carry right into where Carlton have pushed back into as they keep Richmond in front of them. Then the turnover punishment as Cripps wins a free and then honors the lead up to deconing in the pocket. Here's one example where I think we're seeing that surge mentality improved, but still with refinements needed with regards to knowing the right type of disposal at the right time and the execution of that. They've definitely emphasized in the Carlton camp, these angled kicks as we progress down the line. 
very linear angle that continues with multiple kicks. It's just that this sort of kick often let the Blues down and has been for seasons gone by. And whilst the Blues actually have the numbers, they aren't crisp enough with their disposal. And Lockie Fogarty actually had a chance to kick here. Grimes came forward to impact initially. Short's gone straight to Kerno and also sort of zoned off. Meaning whilst Fogarty is unattended, he's facing a little bit of indecision. That extra handball allowed the rollover by Vloston and with numbers converging and Charlie kicking on that same side. I think he just shits himself and just wants out of the possession ASAP. Such little things which could have turned the possession into something of a far better outcome. Against stronger defensive units, you'd rather not clamp yourself down in the back half, have to try handball your way out and, you know, risk turnover of your own. Rather, you would want it locked in your forward half, as we've noted and as we've highlighted the positive results that come with that. In the Brisbane game, Carlton's second quarter evening up and second half blitz, at the core of all that was the pressure shift. This demonstrates that if Carlton are going to bang on about contest and pressure, they legitimately need to show it because that is what their success depends upon. And these stats prove it. Carlton had 41 first half tackles against the Tigers, a plus 17 in that category. And it's clear that in such a game where the Blues could not win it close, being able to keep it that contained and ensure the impact didn't occur beyond those tightly contested situations, that was so important. Obviously that paired with the territory advantage. There's one other element that has been a massive plus, and this is, well, pretty obvious, but Harry Mackay. If you want to see the full video I did about him in preseason, which I sort of tried to preempt what we may see from him, make sure to check out the video top right hand corner or in the description down below. Harry Mackay has dished up a couple of great performances, kicking monumental and timely goals and taking some really nice contested grabs. He's been a focal point for Carlton inside 50, constantly being referred to as a target so far this year at a higher rate than Charlie Kerno. However, as I preach through my work, Sporting success is built off nuance and the less acknowledged moments. We talked about pressure and contest, and this is one example which I admire from Harry, which embodies that. We've got give or take about one or so minutes left in the game. We know that we're holding onto a very slender lead. Cunners has just one Carlton a clearance. Obviously, we're flooding our back line, which means in the front half, the forward half, we're going to have the outnumber not going our way. Harry Mackay is going back with the flight, and naturally with a two-on-one, a Richmond player actually facing the footy, that should be a nailed on mark. Whilst Harry doesn't actually take the grab, heck, actually hold up the play, it's that sort of endeavor and courage we've seen from him, which I think was overshadowed by the media and the wider AFL community due to the goal kicking issues last year. And even with the successes of this season in front of goal, Harry in round one against the Tigers, had seven tackles, 17 pressure acts, and had nine contested possessions. And I think those stats epitomize a strong body of work in this game that key forwards rarely get recognized for. And all the more staggering where those stats placed him amongst his teammates. But that is not all. I think a growth piece of Harry's game is not as obvious as saying, well, he's kicking goals, you know, the run up looks good, it's more fluid. It's actually the Charlie Harry Mackay chemistry for me. They've looked more fluent and dynamic as a pairing. And to look against Richmond when the game slowed up a little bit, the kicking inside 50 was a little bit odd. It felt like we were falling back into old habits a little bit. But in the Brisbane game, if we want to talk about fluency, the comeback promoted fluent play. And that was the Harry Charlie tandem personified. You can see Harry Mackay a meter or two out from the square. And this one drops in front of Kerno, who is a little bit shallower. Want to point out with Harry, he in previous weeks, years, would probably chase this mark down. But notice how he halts his run and leaves it all to Charlie. Keeps Andrews away and also prevents him getting in the way, potentially spoiling Charlie as well. The smalls are a little bit more standoffish, which means the kick isn't as contested as it should be from a Lions defensive standpoint because there are mostly mids around, not recognized defenders, and the Lions almost look as one-paced as we did in the opening quarter of this match. 
Harry can tend to be a little bit clumsy with his on-field decision making, but what he did there was a conscious decision. And that for me indicates an intelligence that I haven't really seen a crap ton of. And I think that attempt to mend his goal kicking woes sort of indicates growth in that respect as well. But I think the main point of concern, which will look to be amended in quick time with Wiedering returning, is that defensive vulnerability. At stages, we've seen one-on-ones constantly expose our backline and more importantly, our goal. And it feels like there's an element of indecision and a lack of communication without the defensive anchor of Wiedering in the backline. And we've talked about this as far back as the first preseason game, which you are also more than welcome to watch to see Wheaters and his importance. Here's one example from the first quarter of the Tigers game. Carlton were very lucky to not concede here from kick-in. De Koning had just missed, but was stuck covering personnel on this side of the ground. The lack of communication meant there was zero urgency to put someone sizable on Nankervis. This leaves Lewis Young to pick up two, and with Adam Chera the spare, he is the player that has to go to the contest. Lewis Young being nudged out of the way, which is a weakness of his, means there's absolutely vulnerability here if the mark's taken. Even though the mark isn't taken, Taranto gets goal side. We're just lucky that that rove wasn't collected and Hewitt can slam Nankervis to the ground. I would have felt Carlton would be more on top of this if you have a Wietering overseeing the field. Now, the controversial Tom Lynch free kick. We mentioned in the first week of the season how important it was or is to secure the ball at centre wing or that middle portion of the ground because if you don't, the last line being Lewis Young gets exposed, which obviously as a Carlton supporter makes you shudder. Williams gambles on the opposite side of the contest to Shy Bolton. Richmond's Rioli bats it in Richmond's favour. Then they spread because the ball in the middle means obviously you can't be further from the boundary line. You're not restricted. You can go both ways. Lewis Young positionally isn't actually in a bad place because Ross is wrong-sided. On his right side, he's only favoured to send the kick here, which Lewis Young is actually in position to chop off. But the moment Hollands permits the turn back the other way, all of a sudden, Richmond have the upper hand. Now you have access to that spot, leading to Lewis Young's concession of a free because he's in absolutely no man's land. Whilst Young probably didn't do an atrocious job, it just emphasizes the importance upfield of that pressure and contest, as we've mentioned, to ensure this doesn't happen. Here's another case of it. This isn't a one-on-one, -on -one, this is a two-on-nothing. Now, the ball does alter direction going towards Hewitt, and I can understand what Hollands may have been thinking, but this is a cardinal sin here. And I personally am guilty of doing this in my own experiences. What Hollands does here is give Hewitt the false sense of security he's collecting the ball. Not only doesn't he go for it, but he also gets in Hewitt's way. You just have to communicate that a little better. Now, that loss of contest in the middle means whilst the Blues have the numbers, this could have resulted in a lot worse of a result. Every day of the week, this is Young's ball, and he's done something very similar to what Hollands did upfield with that false sense of security. It catches your teammate off guard, Saad gets to its second because of that, and we're lucky that Dusty's probably lost the extra yard of pace because he's gone for the all or nothing, hasn't tried to get around the defender. Miscommunication on two occasions by the Blues nearly conceded a goal as a result. And yet again, whilst definitely you've got a lack of communication and authority without Wietering in the side, it starts further upfield from that personnel, aka the mids, the rucks, defensive players that have adopted more attacking positions. In most examples, to keep it away from this potential of, you know, weird shit happening on the last line with Lewis Young. Ultimately, the Blues have had a cracking start. Two wins from two games, why would you complain? They've blooded some new faces, have sustained a low volume of injuries in those two weeks as well. And both games have been met with adversity and also challenges against two very different oppositions at opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to aspirations for this season and the trajectory of each footy club. The Blues 
by no means are the finished product. And whilst there is plenty to fix, there is also a reason for Blues fans to be excited because we're seeing a side to Carlton and a glimpse of Carlton football, which we have not seen in a long time. And it is probably, potentially, not going to go out and say for sure, but it is something that could be one of the final pieces of the puzzle for the Blues in terms of becoming a complete football side. What do you think? What's the main bit of success you've found so far? And what's going to be the key factor that requires fixing going forward as the Blues push towards the mid-season buy and potentially take those strides in order to become a serious contender? Hope you enjoyed this one. Make sure to like, subscribe. We'll be back for another analysis next week. So if you want to stay tuned, make sure to subscribe and, and turn on those notifications. But that'll do it. Thank you very much for tuning in and watching. Stay safe. I look forward to discussing what the future holds from a Blues perspective in the coming weeks. Have a good one. We'll chat to you soon. Bye for now.